Today, it's an absolute privilege to speak to Peg Do Doherty Marcus, the co-founder of the HBA, the Healthcare Business Women's Association. The HBA was founded in 1977 by Peg and four of her peers. It's a global non-profit organization comprising individuals and organizations from across the healthcare industry. And the latest membership numbers on the HBA Global are over 13,000 individual members, 12% of which are outside the US. There are 180 corporate partners representing a collective 250 50 organizations in more than 50 locations, reaching a community of more than 70,000. Peg, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Good morning from Florida. Morning. Very well. Welcome, Peggy. Honestly, I've been so looking forward to this. Would you mind starting off by just spending a few minutes talking about you, your background, and why you started the HBA? Well, um, I started in the healthcare advertising industry on my actual 23rd birthday in uh, October of 1973. And uh, my agency unfortunately uh, went under in May of 1975. And my boss, Rest His Soul, and I uh, were retained by our client, Astra Pharmaceutical Products, to go find a new ad agency with their product line. And we wound up at an agency called Lady Wolf Swift on Madison Avenue in New York City. And um, I started as an account person there with Astra. And then due to client conflicts with another advertiser, uh, we resigned the Astra account. Um, Doug went into heading up copywriting and I started the media department. I was the 14th employee of Lady Wolf Swift. Um, and then the joy ride began. Uh, and um, I got to meet uh, Sheila Sinking, um, again, rest her soul, and Sheila was working for a magazine publisher and called on me and um, recognized that women did not know each other. The women were starting to sell ad space and um, said I should come with her to meet these other ladies. And um, Ruth Smith, uh, now MD, Dr. Smith, Ruth was a scientist at Pfizer in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, in the, in the plant which was the original site of Charles Pfizer's chemistry plant. And um, Williamsburg, Brooklyn was also the original home of where Astra came. And that's why our bagels are so amazing. And mm -hmm. because the East River had the cleanest water uh, literally in any part of the United States. I can't say that now, but it certainly did then. And um, Ruth saw a, a job post for a product manager at the headquarters on 42nd Street in New York, and she applied for it. And well, actually, there was another sign that really disturbed her in the cafeteria that said women will be terminated at seven months. <laughs> she didn't know what that meant and went in and asked HR and they explained to her that pregnant women would be terminated at seven months um, due to the probably the proximity to whatever they were doing back at that time. She went into New York, came into New York and uh, interviewed in front of all of these men who uh, told her that she had all the qualifications to be the product manager for Vibromycin, except she didn't have the balls to be a product manager, and that's the term they used. And Ruth, very simply and calmly, she's the exact opposite of me, said, gentlemen, I do have balls. They're just anatomically placed elsewhere on my body. <laughs> and she got the job, and she was the first female ever product manager at a pharmaceutical firm. Um, and just finish up. And then uh, Melissa Griska was a pharmacist and she was the first female ever uh, account executive at Medicus Advertising, which is Met and Bolt. Um, and Diane Anderson, who was a, also a journal rep for the International Medical News Group. And we sat down, there was a, a one or two other women that came and went kind of thing, but the five of us realized that no one knew each other. I knew as a media director reaching out to my fellow media directors for shared clients, uh, them calling me back was literally didn't happen. And it was, you know, why? And it was really the fear of losing their jobs or, uh, I mean, HBA was so now down the road. We had, I mean, we're just saying that women weren't at events uh, at that time. The Pharmaceutical Advertising Council, PAC, was the boys game, game club and uh, golf and whatever, whatever, and they'd have a lunch, lunch meeting. 
Um, Doug took me to one actually uh, very early on in my career and they asked him why he brought his secretary. And um, you could count the women on one hand and have fingers left over. And um, so the opportunity for women to meet women had nothing to do with, ne you know, job net, net, that, that never even crossed our paths. It was, we need to meet each other and let us know that these opportunities are coming. We, 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 we knew it, we, we could feel it. Um, I was the only woman in management at Lady. Um, and we sat and we had a couple more lunches and then it started to get serious as um, the rumble was starting. And um, uh, another chairman of another ad agency had wanted me to join him, but uh, it had some bad aura and I went, thank you very much. But I asked him if I could have his conference room. Uh, why? I said, can't tell you. And we came up with a date and a location and a time and uh, uh, we wrote up a flyer um, and to the precursors, to those of you that are listening, a mimeograph machine was the precursor to the copy machine. And it was something you typed and you laid it on top of the drum and you rolled off copies and you inked it continuously. Um, that's what my dad worked for a company called AB Dick and dad ran off the flyers for me and we folded them up into blank number 10 envelopes. And Melissa took some and Ruth took some and I took some. And every sales rep that called on me, journal sales rep, got a stack of those um, to drop off wherever they may, had, had a call. Uh, they would ask the receptionist, female, how many ladies' rooms they had, and they were to please post them in those ladies' rooms. And then we got to the agency, and we waited. <laughs> and we had 108 women show up. Wow. Always conference room standing, leaning against the windows with me having a heart attack that someone would go out the window. Um, and it was, okay, here we go. And we knew we had unearthed Pandora's box. Um, so I think once that happened, I mean, we really knew um, our jobs were in jeopardy, our reputations were in jeopardy, our careers were in jeopardy. I was the only one of the five at the time that had uh, financial support if I got canned. Um, but uh, my husband who did, Bob Marcus, did pay the bills for the first three years of our organization. Um, Bob made sure uh, in checking with uh, the Labor Department and uh, New York State Department of Labor that um, if we didn't do anything about HBA during, during our office hours, quote unquote, um, they could not retaliate. So, okay, continue. Um, as I was, was saying, is that uh, going to the State Department, New York State Department of Labor eventually did come into play when I was threatened. Um, why were you, job. why was that a threat, Peg? Was it simply because there, there were no events, as you said, for women? There were, they were seen as secretaries, but you... The women, if you saw a colleague, a female colleague, it was at a sports day. It was an annual event called the PAC Sports Day, which turned into a, the guys were all golfing, a few women. Women would hang by the pool. Everybody could shower dress and go to this thing. And it would turn into, and if it was a bad day, uh, weather-wise, I mean, sloppy, drunk, out of control human beings. Um, and that was your one day to, um, and it, but, and there you weren't paid for, uh, a journal rep took you. Uh, so it was, um, we didn't play golf. We didn't take four hour lunches. And as I told John, I looked ridiculous in plaid pants. Um, he was the, the, it really was, the PAC was it. And it was like, what was this girl's group? That's how we were referred to. What's, what's doing with the girl's group? So, um, and moving on is six months into it. Um, so we started in 77. Um, we started to have monthly meetings in New York. Uh, we charged $3. Can I ask a question before we, sure. before we skip six months? That first meeting, 180 women showed up. 108. 108, 108 sorry. 108 showed up. It was bursting. What did you talk about? Who got up? What did you say? Like, how did you initiate? Because there was well, no agenda. Actually, yeah, the first lady that got up was, thank you, was Ronnie Hoffman, who stood over six feet tall. And Ronnie was a copywriter originally at Levy and then had gone off to join 
uh, David Frank, Alan Gross, and Jane Townsend in their ad agency. Uh, she's no longer with us, unfortunately. And basically had a voice really, I mean, if you think I have a loud one, my God. And it was, um, and basically Ruth and I got up and just said, it's, we're here because we want to know each other and we want to know each other and we want you to know each other. And um, what do you think? And it didn't have a name. We didn't know we were going to be the Healthcare Business Women's Association. Um, we just knew, write your names down. No, no emails. Okay, no emails. <laughs> Um, no computers like this. Um, oh my God. Um, <laughs> lots of bits of paper, lots of bits of paper with a telephone. lot of mail, a lot of, a lot of mail, lots of, lots of stamps and lots of mail. Um, but we really use the, um, journal sales reps as pony express. I mean, if I needed stuff to get down to what that time, Siba guy goes, uh, Siba Geige or Sandoz or, or uh, Smith Klein or Bristol Myers, or you would, uh, whatever it was, you'd, you'd hand a pile off to a sales rep. And um, we had over 1,100 products at Levy. So I saw hundreds and hundreds of reps. Because that seems to me like a pretty innocent purpose. Let's just know each other. And yet you still knew that you were, you felt at the time that this was wrong, that it was going to be frowned on and you could even lose your job. Oh, we, we knew, um, oh, we knew from the, I think, uh, you know, the, the reps, I think Sheila and Diane rest their souls. I think they knew, um, they, they saw people because they were reps, um, and Ruth saw reps. I saw reps, um, and I started to see it, but we, we knew that there were women just, we didn't care if you were a secretary. I didn't care. I didn't care what. It was just, hey, there's a lot of us out there and we don't know each other. And for me, as I say, it was, why isn't this media director from this agency calling me back? Why isn't this media director calling me back? We share a client. I'm not a threat. I, I mean, I remember saying to one of them, I do not want your job. I have this job, <laughs> I, but you need to talk to me here. Um, and uh, it was, it was, you know, I think it was just fear at first. I really do. I think it was fear. Um, and um, again, there was not, I, you weren't going to be recruited in. <laughs> you, and um, it was the boys club. I mean, no ifs, ands, or buts. And the thing that I knew could happen, um, and I know you and I spoke about, when I was at Burdick uh, the year before, or two years before, I had the opportunity to get involved and eventually sit on the board of Advertising Women of New York, uh, which was all consumer and women who own their own ad agencies and, and Carolyn Wall, publisher of New York Magazine, Kathy Black, first female publisher of USA Today. And it was like, wait, why is it, why is it okay here, but it's not over here. And so I, I knew it, it, it existed and it was like, okay, why isn't it transferring over to this side of the industry? And and um, and I, because of being absorbed by BBDO, I would go down to 437 Madison or 347 and women just everywhere running around with maniacs. And it was like, mm. so I think for me, um, because I had seen it with Oni, Advertising Women in New York. Um, and that's who I drew on in our first meetings. They were my right. So, so project forward, you, you met that first time, 108 women. And then did you say, right, okay, let's meet again. And did it just slowly grow over time? And there was just this continual meeting of the same people and then more people got recruited. How did it evolve? I think more photocopies that my dad made. <laughs> yeah. uh, put my dad to work, rest his, um, and brothers and sisters stuffing envelopes. But I, um, you know, I involved everybody. I mean, no one was safe. But it was um, first getting to the Hotel Roosevelt, and even at that time, at that time, the room rental was one hundred and twenty-five dollars. That was staggering. Okay, so the thing: how are we going to pay for it? Well, we had we. We, we had a bucket 
like, you know, here, throw in whatever you can. And maybe we got 50, maybe we got 75. And Bob, of course, I'd come home and say, I need whatever to pay the bill so I don't bounce it. We also wanted to have a bar, but women didn't have an expense account. Oh, we had no expense account. Hold on, so hold on. Let me just, so are you saying that as an, in, in your capacity working on the advertising side, you didn't have an expense account? Not and, me. And, Not and the men, me. and the men did? Sure. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I got, I mean, I had a credit card, but, um, which I, Astra had actually gotten me back, you know, back at, at verdict. But, um, I remember going to lunch with, I told this the other day with 10 guys, 10 account client and 10 account, account guys. And, client. and we go across the street to this restaurant and Ron Freddy doesn't have his wallet. He's paid, can you pick up the tab? Sure, I'll pick up the tab. And I put my credit card down and the waiter comes over and says, Miss Doherty, your card is perfectly accept, uh, fine. I said, excuse me? He says, yes, your, your card's okay. And I said, and why wouldn't it be? Now, again, this was another, you know, like embarrass the female. So <gasps> Bob taught me from day one, and I'm with my husband since I'm 20 and a half, over 50 years. And... Bob said, if you ever want to get back at somebody, you do not leave the tip line empty. Zero, zero, point, zero, one. I can't. So, Go on. So I left a penny tip. So as we started to leave, the manager who knew us uh, says, Peg, move over. And the waiter is on my tail, on my tail. And you and whatever, and the manager said, Peg, what happened? And he said, ask him. And he turned around the waiter and said, you're fired. So thank goodness, thank goodness. I mean, I can that, I mean, I the I can't believe really this day and age that that would actually happen. But it seems it seems like there was the, the a bit of resentment. And and also, Peg, I just have to point out this yeah. this thing about not having an expense account, but the other people did. Does, did that was the implication that you would never be taking out clients to to entertain so well, as just... media director as media director i did did not have an expense account um and um but i wound up because some of my account guys weren't um sober enough to take the client to dinner um after they'd come back from their you know mad men um lunches which were four plus hours um so I did, you know, I think you and I talked about it is, is I did take a male client to dinner and um, it turned out very poorly for him. Please, please tell and, that story, Peg. Please tell well, that story. Well, I went out with the octopus and another tip that we, we did, and I still will tell anyone listening to this, if you're female, do not, repeat, do not go to a restaurant that doesn't know you. You can pick a restaurant where the manager knows you, the maitre d' knows you, the bartender knows you, the sommelier knows you. Do not go to a restaurant with a meal under any circumstances. It does date anything. It doesn't matter. You go where they know you. If there's a problem, they're there to help. So I took this particular gentleman. No, I won't say gentleman. I took this guy to the restaurant and um, the hands are all over my leg. And the third time I lifted his hand up on the table and I explained to him, I picked up the steak knife, which rather large and I informed him if he touched me again I would impale his hand to the table and the three things would occur um if you're Irish in New York you're related to a cop and um I said the likelihood of one of my cousins walking in here um NYPD is about 100 percent secondly um you're going to have to explain to your wife why you have a huge hole in your hand and thirdly, you're going to have to explain to your client why you have a huge hole in your hand. And I slid out of the booth and told the manager to feed him, and I went home. And the next morning, I went into the agency, and all the guys, you know, you, 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 everybody in the conference room, and um, informed them that no female was to be left alone with this guy. And um, we started to hear about other episodes um about him and it took us three years before it reached the chairman um uh hr wouldn't you, well number one women wouldn't say anything they would tell us at an hva meeting in private but they would not um take it out there 
uh, for fear of retribution. And it took us three years for, uh, for I don't know how it got, but we made sure that the, the chairman heard what was going on. He was fired. Now, again, this yeah. is horrendous for any woman to go through. So, I mean, I love the way you handled that, Peg. Let me just put that on record because that is genius, absolutely genius. But I remember you saying to me that you realized that this was, was, this was rife, this was happening to many women, oh. and, that, and that this was the start for you of putting some help and some support and tips for other women in business. Is that right? It, that was part, yeah, that became we, part of your... Yeah, I think the first, you know, I was traveling, I had been traveling, um, so I had the benefit, but now the publications industry exploded, and now you have dozens and dozens and dozens of women traveling for the first time. You have women in, in very junior account positions, again, traveling. Um, and we really recognize that, um, and when I love do telling the story is, um, and for you listening, okay, there was no wizard, there was no president's club, there were no lounges, there were uh, no click, click, and your car lights up, and there were no, it was no GPS. And so you've gotten off an aircraft, and you're on a bus with a whole bunch of people, and they drop you at the end of a line of 50 cars with like one lamp and a blizzard, and you're supposed to find your vehicle and then hope you don't run into Sasquatch and, you know, standing there and then try to get out of that parking lot and get to a hotel where you had a, you know, oh God, truck driver budget to stay in this hotel, try to eat without getting poisoned or attacked, going back to your room and, um, and then get to the client. And so that's, so we taught airplane safety, do not ever, ever, ever get on, listen to the instructions, look in front of you, look behind you. Um, I have a friend who did survive the plane that flipped upside down in Iowa and she was hanging by her seatbelt when the plane broke in two um, and walked out through the cornfield. So I, she wow. knew where she was in relation to, the, to where she was, when she was hanging upside down with a child hanging upside down next door. So I do, do look, pay attention, people. It's really serious. Always in your profiles for hotels now, which you now have, don't go higher than the 10th floor because the ladder can't reach higher than 10th floor. So it was hotel safety. At one point, the majority of people who, who perished in hotel fires, unfortunately were on the floor and climbed and tried doors and the door that opened was housekeeping and they would die in there. Those doors are now locked. So the first thing I do, I don't care where I am to, to this day, just bolt your door for a sec, go down and count with your hand how many doors to the, the, the door exit, uh, the fire door exit. And, and you just, you just want to be safe. And then, um, you know, it was airport safety. It was don't eat at a bar. It was like, I don't care if you are the only one. Ask for a table. And you don't want the one by the kitchen door. You want a table. Bring a book. Don't sit there like waiting for somebody to come up and ask you to join them for dinner. Bring a book, bring your work, whatever, but do not sit at a bar. Um, ask for a low floor, ask close to the elevator. Mine's that my room is no more than three rooms off the elevator. So the, we just wanted people to be safe, but the my consumer ad agency women were teaching this. Really? They were teaching this, saying, ladies, this is what you need to do. Then we got into the fun spot of don't wear red, don't do this, don't do this. Sheila bought a fur coat and it was $900. And she got it from the famous Fred the Furrier in New York and Alexander's. And I think it was a dead raccoon. I don't know what it was. I mean, it made her look like, you know, a Notre Dame. But I, so, of course, I had to run out and try to buy one of those too. Anyway, Sheila took it to a client visit and was told by the product manager that he wasn't giving her any business because she apparently could afford a fur coat and he couldn't buy one for his wife, so he wouldn't give her any business. Okay, there we go. So the deal was, if you were going to call on this client, wear a garbage bag and leave the animal in the trunk. So do not wear, you know, so it went out. <laughs> it was like, it was protection, protection, protection. It sounds like very practical advice. And question for you, would you say, because obviously you started these uh, safety tips all those years ago, do you believe they're as relevant today as they, as they were back then? More. 
um, you hear more, um, I hate to use this, you know, the date rape and um, the physical assaults within, within uh, I'm not hearing anything of sexual assault um, from all the, the, the chapters I'm speaking to. Um, uh, uh, harassment, yes, but not, not assault. I mean, um, I think HR department um, and now with DEI and everything, I think HR department, when, when I think when HR people found out they could go to jail for not reporting an incident, um, I think that's when they took it seriously. And um, I mean, I, I, a very, very close friend of mine was one of the Playboy Bunnies. And um, she's part of this A&E um, TV series right now. And she was sexually assaulted by Bill Cosby. She's one of those 75 women and nobody believed her. Nobody believed all of those other women. Um, nobody believed, and now they've of course let him out of jail where he should rot. But, um, you know, so, you know, the, many, many people did not report, you know? I, um, yeah, sorry. I have to say, no, I, I, look, this isn't a topic that I've talked about a lot on this podcast. In fact, I've only had one guest, Zoe Skaman, and we touched on this. She wrote an article recently and she invited lots of um, feedback and she was inundated with women writing to her saying this stuff is still happening yeah. and I have my own story and journey and yeah. incidents is happening to me as someone that's always been a woman in business and it is astounding and I, I actually get very triggered to listen and I noticed that on LinkedIn you are very supportive of other women who are telling their story publicly because I, I haven't shared the details of what happened to me publicly yet maybe I will but you, yeah, well, I've seen that you are very supportive. To well, women. I was, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I was jumped at the agency um, and um, from behind. And it was unfortunately because that's what I'm saying, because of all of my drunken idiots um, and my stoned copywriters and art directors sitting around just waiting, I would probably get uh, a media schedule or a, a, a drawing of something, you know, like, Peg, it's going to be five color, 12 color, whatever the hell it is. It's going to be 25 pages, 50 pages. And then have to write or come up with a media schedule. Usually get home around two o'clock in the morning. Um, it's guys, we're talking typewriter. Okay. Um, get this thing done, get it over to the, the printer, uh, get it to the, the, you know, cut run off and then get, go home, shower, come back to the agency and climb in a car, usually around six o'clock in the morning, with hungover, smelly, alcohol permeating, and tobacco. Uh, we were a healthcare agency, and they smoked like, like nothing was wrong. And, um, and I called, as I told you, the clown car, driving to a client and just wishing I could put the windows up on the, you know, down. Um, and, um, but I was jumped, and, and, the guy never knew what hit him. And, and I didn't know I could scream. I didn't know I could scream, but I turned around and beat the living the Jesus out of him. Um, and um, he was, uh, he'd worked for the printing company. Um, and he, I mean, but just, but I, I was also robbed at gunpoint in with a, you know, guns to my head. So I had in two restaurants in Manhattan. So, you know what? It's, I mean, um, you try to harm me, get out of the way. <laughs> well, thank goodness you reacted like that because I know that you can either go into fight or you can go to freeze mode, can't you? And thank goodness you managed to fight him off in that, that instant. I didn't, you know, I say to this day, I'm one of eight kids and five girls and three boys. And my father would always say, I have, pet, you know, I've got seven and Peggy. <laughs> But, um, and I used to say to him, dad, I do look like the others. I mean, we look like cookie cutters for God's sakes, but uh, we were taught to, you know, to protect ourselves from day one. I mean, that was dad's and mom's, uh, you know, we beat the crap out of each other, but let somebody else harm one of our brothers and sisters. Yeah. Peg, is this something that you feel the most passionate about? How women are actually treated sexually, physically, emotionally in business? Is that the thing that, is that the thing that gets you most passionate because clearly something was driving you to build 
this organization to this big to to have the consistency and the tenacity to keep going so what's what's dr driven you um i love people um i love people and um i'm an i'm a networker i'm a connector and um i was fortunate in my role and in my job to meet people and then you had these other ladies that were in every other kind of situation, whether they were an executive assistant, junior AE, it didn't matter. I mean, when Ruth and I, um, Melissa doesn't come to the Wodies, she is with Doctors Without Borders. And I would imagine she's in Ukraine now. Um, she's been in Haiti for the past two and a half years. But when Ruth, Dr. Smith and I, and I just want to back up for one sec. After six months, we, we elected Ruth because she was the first female product manager. We thought, okay, you know, okay, let's start off. And that's why Karen Caton was our first Wody, um, the most senior woman in, in the industry at that time. And um, six months in, Ruth calls me and tells me to come down to Pfizer. And I go down and she says, I've got good news and bad news. And I always want to hear the bad news first. I mean, tell me the bad news. And she said, I'm leaving Pfizer. And uh, I said, oh my God, where are you going? And she said, medical school. And Ruth was 38 years old. And I said, um, any particular medical school? She said, uh, Jefferson in Philadelphia. And I said, any particular reason? She said, I'm with the first class of women. Wow. So here we go. So we, uh, she needed a microscope. And a microscope ran about $500 back then. So through our new network, we... Uh, got in touch with uh, Zeiss in Long Island, and they sold us one for about $150, and they inscribed it to her, and uh, we gave it to her, HB, and gave it to her as a gift, and uh, I think we've paid it off now, and <laughs> Ruth became an AIDS specialist in Manhattan when she returned, and uh, she is now at the age of 75. She is a competitive senior ice skater. So things we do in our lives. So uh, yeah, she is. She's going to need a new knee because she took a really, really bad fall a couple months ago. But, um, but what Ruth, uh, and then I became president for three and a half years, finished her term and mine. Um, but what's amazing for Ruth and I when we do go, and we go because we're, we, we're, she, me more than she, um, I want everyone to know our history. Um, we are not, you know, oh, it's HBA. It's, nobody knows our history. Nobody knows our history. In every chapter I'm talking to, no one knows our history. And, um, and what we did um, and the chances we took. And, you know, am I the, I, you know, I, I talked to, am I the dinosaur or the mother hen? Both. Um, but I am the historian. And um, I've had to get into it with HBA when, when something is um, erroneously. Uh, we, we, you know, HBA started in 79. Nope, nope, I was there. <laughs> we incorporated in 1979 when we started to do structure. Um, we had men from day one as members. Um, they couldn't vote, couldn't hold office, uh, unlike what's happened recently. Um, and, um, because they had expense accounts and they could buy the drinks. And, um, and I think what was happening is we, we did a Halloween Eve mean, or we did a Halloween well, October 30th event. And we went from Jane Towns and townhouse to uh, a famous ballet school to the CBS recording studio ballroom to, I think our last event was probably about 800 people. You had to wear a costume. So for all you people, so I went as a syringe. <laughs> I went as a thermometer. I went as a media insertion order with wearing the front and back like a sandwich board. Oh it had goodness. the front of the ad and the back of the, which no one ever bothered to read, the back of the paperwork, the contract. Then my colleague had the cancellation for that media order um and it was the party no one absolutely no one missed that 
party. And then because of PAC, we would tag on to PAC. Their event would always be the Friday of Memorial Day weekend and or maybe the week before. And the Thursday night, we would be at the Philadelphia Museum. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and in Boston and Chicago. And um, yeah. So, I, when, yeah. You tell, when you tell this story, Peg, I want to be part of your gang so badly because it's, you sound like a group of such ballsy women that were making huge changes. So tell me, because you said no one knows the stories, you share with me some of the big sort of massive challenges you had to continuing the HBA. Well, you know, what you and I talked about was salary. And um, we, uh, I asked a, a, a gentleman friend, um, a guy friend, uh, who owned a market research firm as they were all owned by men, um, if he would help us with a salary survey and um, didn't want to know your name. I wanted to know if you work for the company, you work for the, I mean, the client, the agency, the publication. I want to know, you know, hours, what benefits you had, 401k, blah, blah, blah. TOs, did you have, what was your vacation? Um, was there a bonus? Was there, a, did you have an expense account? And we got back about a 96% response, which he said had, and again, doing it by mail with a self-stamped envelope back to him, made it us, had to mail them to the women's homes, not to the workplace. <laughs> and we made it as simple as just fill in the damn thing and send it back. And Mahesh uh, calculated everything, came back, and then I took it to medical marketing and media. I took it to medical advertising news. I took it to pharmaceutical executive uh, the, and farm exec had never had a female on the cover ever. Um, I think Karen might've been the first one in the uh, late nineties. Um, and I asked them to publish it and they all said no. And, um, we sat down, said, okay, so hi dad, we need you. And I think we sent out, if I, if I say 500, it could be 5,000, send them to every corporate HR department and every CEO, putting them on notice. So, um, I mean, I found out that the guy next to me, not only was making about 40,000 more than me, 40,000, um, he was also receiving bribes oh my God. to the Super Bowl and to the Derby and with publications. And he had involved clients in it. And um, I went that shit because it was my reputation. And um, I went to the partners and I told them that I was going to the police. I mean, I, if they didn't do something, um, I didn't give, I really didn't care what happened to this guy. I mean, just, he had to go. But the fact that he had um, involved a client who was adorable and stupid um, and was going along, hey, you get invited to the Super Bowl. Hey, you know what? You know, the jet, the whole bit um, paid for by a publishing company. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So this was the era of the boys club. And ah, you, oh you, my God. <laughs> you as women were, were forming, forming a group together to kind of highlight the injustice of, of what was happening and to support, support other women in, in their role, in their business capacity. So, so tell me, like, going forward now to present day, what have you seen have been the biggest changes in the industry for women? <laughs> uh, the academic level. Um, when Ruth and I go, uh, we make a point. Um, the day before Wody, um, the past presidents, as many you, as we could you explain get. what Wody, Wody is? Oh, excuse or... me, Woman of the Year event, um, which is now in its 30s. This will be its 32nd, where a woman is selected um, by her peers, um, and the male mentor is selected by his peers or her peers, um, and then the, the Star Award, and it's presented uh, in May, of, of, and this will be the first in person since 2019. Um, last year, we had over 7,500 um, attendees virtual from around the world. 
uh, in person, 2019 is we capped at just a hair under 3,000 people in the Marriott Hotel. Um, and I don't think, you know, with the guys winning the award, I don't think it was, um, I don't think originally, I have to say that, I don't think the guys uh, that won the male mentor award really, you know, in the, the first one or two. And then all of a sudden it was, oh, wow. Oh, wow. This is the award that men in industry now want. That this is the, it doesn't matter who gives you recognition. Name a building at nothing. You want the HBA award. And, um, and as I say, Wody, um, we, uh, it's extraordinary. I mean, every color, every race, every, I mean, from Iranian to African-American to Persian, everything, everything across the board. Um, and it's quite a, you know, it's quite an exciting. So when Ruth and I, um, what happens is the CEs, the chair emeritus, the former presidents, we meet with the rising stars uh, the Monday before the event. Well, this year will be Tuesday, but always usually it was Thursday. And we meet with the ladies um, and each of us chair a table. And, you know, they give me a list of questions. I'm like, I don't need this. Can't go away. <laughs> is, okay, everybody at this table introduce each other, you know, and swap cards. Okay, because you guys are going to be the first ever group of friends. From this, you start here. And I don't, you know, like, no, I don't need to hear what they say. So, and, and then I take this group and Ruth takes her, I take the, our two tables out to dinner Monday night. But there is a cocktail reception. And so I take, so at least there's the first bonding that they'll never forget. And then, and then you go, Wody, and um, the, and, and Ruth takes one end of the stage and I take the other. And every female that comes down with her award is uh, greeted and congratulated by either Ruth or myself. Wow. Uh, and, um, and now with the 10 that we know, or the 12 we know, they all get hugs. So now the person standing behind is like, you know, what about me? What about me? <laughs> um, you know, everybody, I'm a hugger. I'm just a hugger. No, this COVID was very big. I'm a hugger. So, um, and that's what I'm saying. See, I will, and then I'll stay in touch with them. And um, one of the young ladies from India just is on the front cover of women in healthcare in India. And when you open her article, it's me and she at Wodi in 20, whatever it is. So, you know, you know, you've, you know, you've touched somebody, but to go back when Ruth and I see the academic degrees behind their names and with their dot and you're going, I mean, wow, wow. I know le the level of academics, the level of their jobs, um, not only rising stars and then you get to the luminaries, but it's, oh my God. And the other thing that fascinates us, of course, is all the corporate sponsor bon uh, banners. We, I'm like, Ruth, who is that? What is that? What yeah. was that? Yes. So, you know, there were 10 pharmaceutical people, 10, you know, there were like 10 and, you know, by 2000. And now it's like, who, what is that? So, and the fact yeah. that you know that it was Charles Pfizer, I wonder how many people that work for Pfizer understand that it was actually Charles. Well, maybe they do, but other people know that it was started by Charles Pfizer. It was a German chemist, and that um, penicillin was invented in Brooklyn by Sir Alexander Fleming in the Pfizer labs in Brooklyn, um, saving millions of lives during World War One from the Spanish influenza. Um, but um, and some really extraordinary people came through Charles Pfizer. So for, but, yeah. for you and Ruth, you must be so proud of what you've both achieved, looking, looking at how they've reached the academic heights, looking at all these co oh. corporate sponsors. What else still kind of strikes you as so um, incredible of what, of, of what it's turned into today? <laughs> um, this is a subject, you know, that we've, we've talked about. I'm so unbelievably flattered and honored to, to be asked uh, to speak to you and everyone else that um, I'm sorry that it's, we, we're still not there. Um, um, I'm sorry to hear and I'm hearing this and I can't, 
um, I think you and I talked about is there's an expression about sending the elevator down. And I, I do not like that term um, because um, you say send the elevator and I think dumb waiter. And for most of your people, you won't know what that is either, but it was in every restaurant kitchen and you press the button and the meal goes up to a banquet floor or whatever, whatever that's called a dumb waiter. I don't like the elevator. Uh, I, I, that, uh, um, what I am, you know, hearing is that the women, a lot of women who have made it or not paying it forward. And it makes me terribly, I mean, I can't even tell you, it makes me so sad. It makes me so angry that, um, you, you did it. You reached your, your goal. And, and please stop being, you know, uh, what, whatever they call that one from the Dalmatians, you know, Clover, whatever, Clarissa, Cruella. Whatever Thank you. But, and that's how some of them are referring to them. And it's just, that's wrong. That's just, come on, people. So and, what do you, yeah. what do you want them to do? What should they be doing? Pay it forward and make sure that the women underneath them have all of the opportunities that they did and 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 be part of the solution and not the problem and um and another thing that you know and certainly as you know and you know my husband came at, uh, executive recruiting all of his life and and similarly is we still tell and i think i shared that with too is with all the mergers and the acquisitions and everything's going on and people are losing their jobs and one of my functions as a meeting planner with the pfizer group was uh, getting, you know, when Pfizer uh, absorbed Park Davis, Warner Lambert, all of the various and others, and the survivors would have to come to New York and become like best buds in five days. That was my job. They had to be best buds. Showed up Sunday is, you know, complete polar opposites and meaning you got Susie fired and you got this. I'm like, oh my God. And they had to go home like, you know, bosom buddies by Friday. Um, and really what it was is that um, and similar, because I had come through that, I, I had absorbed the staff of someone who was terminated. And, um, you know, I thank God I wasn't in the country when I knew they were trying to make the decision about she or me. Um, and um, what I just always say to now is if two women are up for the same role, okay, all I can suggest and strongly encourage is that okay, we're going to use, you know, Mary, you go in and you tell them that you think you're the, the best candidate, that you have everything they need. However, should they, whatever, have uh, something that you're not aware of that you don't fit the bill, please let me encourage you to, to take Kathy. Okay, Kathy goes in, similar story, take, if I'm not the person, take Mary. Because HR always has, there's always that third person lurking in the background. And HR loves to go and say, yeah, the girls had a cat fight, you know, yada, yada, and bring in the guy. So have each other's back because depending mm -hmm. if it's it, Mary or Susie or whatever it is, whoever gets it is never going to forget what the other one did for her, had her back. And so if there is a promotion or there is an opportunity to bring that other person on board, there's, there's no conversation. Mm -hmm. You had her back. And, and, and the last thing I would just say is that if you are at a function and you see the lone deer in headlights sitting or standing, grab her or him, grab, grab him. I do it at Wody uh, and I just go crazy when I see, you know, some poor girl, woman, lady sitting there. I was like, come on, come on, come on, here we go. And just thrust them into the biggest crowd. And the last thing I would just say is please, I beg you, please, if you're going to have an event, a professional event. Do not have it in a cougar bar. Do not have it in a restaurant where you have a bachelor party in the room next to you and the wall is going like this. Okay, every one of you has a medical center with an auditorium. Every one of you has a hospital with an auditorium. Their public affairs department and marketing departments would go out of their minds. Okay, they have budgets. They have budgets to do exactly that with juice, coffee, tea, they've got a budget. Go where there's parking, safety, and you're not in a cougar bar. Um, I can't, it blows, it just blows my mind. Okay. Brilliant, like, very practical advice. Peg, if, if there's someone listening that's notes. working in, in healthcare communications, they might be working 
for a pharmaceutical company in marketing, they could be in a biotech, they could be in a healthcare communications agency. If someone's listening, and, and uh, particularly the, the women listening who aren't members of HBA at the moment, they maybe this is the first introduction to who the HBA are and, and are obviously keen to accelerate their careers. What, what advice would you give to them? Well, just to know that when you join HBA, you not only join your national or international organization, that's what part of the dues is. And then they identify or you can identify uh, the chapter that you most want to join. You are always welcome at any chapter, anytime, anywhere around the world. Um, and uh, if you are a woman of color, woman of STEM, woman of bio, what, there's all of our affinity groups now, um, which don't cost any additional monies, but then you can become, whether you're a hospital administrator or you're a molecular bi biologist or scientist, um, um, we got a place for you. And, um, and, and, you know, I have a dear friend who is a, you know, um, a genius scientist but she's also a healthcare marketer. And I always have to, you know, cause science is, you know, she, <laughs> this is like, no, we're going this way. So um, I, I don't even know where we're, uh, where we're headed. It, it, it can only get bigger and more because women are really enjoying each other. And just look at LinkedIn, which is 10, at least 10 people are changing jobs every day. Mm. Um, I think the explosion, and this is Bob and I were talking about this last night, there are over 7,000 rare diseases. And all those poor people were on their own. NIH here, National, Health, uh, National Institutes of Health, of which there are nine institutes, um, there was no money for funding and so on and so forth. So they started uh, the, the gene coalition uh, consortium and now there's rare x and so now finally you know with rare disease day last month which is never did i think ever 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 did i think there'd be such a thing um now you have all the biotherapeutic companies um there's gotta be 40 or 50 of them that are new each taking on rare disease but they're taking on either neuromuscular or they're taking on on color, whatever. The, I mean, there could be some serious ends to to some of these, if not all. And and um, it's I mean, for me, it's just um, to see the end of some of these just extraordinary uh, diseases and um, the opportunities. And um, um, I will, you know, I, and anyone reaches out, I'm working with this, as I say, some people right now on their resumes. I am not a headhunter, but when I get finished with your resume, the person I'm sending it to is the CEO. It's not going to HR, it's going to the CEO uh, with my blessing. And, um, and so that's what I'm saying. I'm here, I'm alive, I'm well, thank you, God. Uh, and, you know, here's to, I hope we don't have another 40, but um, that would be my, you know, my little babies. I, I can see how passionate you are about it. And you are, you strike me as a mother hen because you're still making sure that everyone's picking everyone up and that we stick together because that's certainly what you had to do when you first started out. And I love the spirit, Peg, you absolutely exude um, positive energy. And I can imagine that being part of the HBA is a tremendous experience. The conferences you have, the affiliate groups you have, and not to mention the networking opportunities and career acceleration for women in business in the healthcare. So this has been a hugely um, inspiring chat for me. I absolutely am delighted that I've met you. And I will be a huge advocate for people that are working in healthcare from to, to join the organization. Do you have Sorry, any yeah. parting words of advice for any, well, any just, women I, listening? I mean, for, for, for those that are listening, um, HBA's international conference is, I think I mentioned June 16 to 18 in Brussels. Um, it's, uh, I think a thousand um, registrants. Um, so if you really go on hbanet.org, now that's, uh, we have an office in the in Brussels, um, in The Hague, and um, that's our European office. So, but it's hbanet.org. 
Um, and, um, and anybody reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, if I can help in any way, I hope to get over to Brussels. I would really, particularly since we're 45 years. Yes. And um, I, I would really, really, I would love to see if I can get my butt over there. That would be great. I, I think everybody will as well, Peg. Listen, thank you so much, Peg. This has been extraordinary. We will include your links to the website and to your LinkedIn profile on the show notes. And thank you so thank much you, thank again. Thank you a million. Thank you. All the best. Bye.